Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Francois Carrel. I'm the managing director of the International Peace Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to a discussion on the United Nations and uh, Libya. Uh, this event is part of our SRHG series. We're very happy to have with us Ian Martin, who is the special representative of the Secretary General for Libya and the head of the UN support mission in Libya, Hans Mill. Before his current post, Ian Martin held numerous senior positions at the UN, including SRSG in Nepal and Special Envoy for Timor-Leste. And prior to joining the United Nations, he was Secretary General of Amnesty International. It's a great pleasure to welcome you, uh, Ian, at this crucial moment of democratic transition in Libya, right after the successful election of the National Congress. We're looking forward to hearing your comments and uh, your uh, evaluation on the steps ahead. We'll have a Q&A after your presentation. And uh, before we start, you propose to watch a short video on the UN uh, role in the independence of uh, Libya. And I think you want to say a few words to present this uh, video. Yes, I'm going to impose this little YouTube clip uh, on you. I've imposed it on some people I can see here before. Uh, when I uh, was asked to come to New York last year and start thinking about the future UN role in post-conflict Libya, uh, as someone whose original discipline is history, I went out and bought uh, uh, my first book on the history of modern Libya, which I also recommend strongly to you all, called that, A History of Modern Libya by Dirk uh, van der Waller. Was, I selected the right book. Um, and thus I learned, and I'm ashamed that I didn't know it before, thus I learned that the United Nations had played a crucial role in the independence of uh, Libya uh, in 1950 uh, which is a fact which not many people uh, at UN headquarters think about these days, but is a very important living historical fact in Libya itself. So uh, indulge me for a moment and uh, see uh, Adrian Pelt, the United Nations Commissioner for Libya, formerly Assistant Secretary General for Conference Services, uh, arriving in Libya uh, in 1950. Thank you. 
but communist Russia had counter-proposed that she be granted sole authority over Tripolitania. In such a manner, progress had been blocked until November 21st, 1949, when the United Nations voted on a resolution to create an independent Libya. The Russian delegate announced he was against this resolution for an independent Libya. The assembly listened as the delegate from the United Kingdom spoke in favor of the resolution. A vote was called for, and with communist Russia not voting, the resolution carried 48 to 1. With the arrival of a plane at a Libyan airport, the United Nations resolution began to take shape. The United Nations Commissioner, aided by an advisory council, was now in Libya to help establish an independent government. The Commissioner was Adrian Pelt of the Netherlands. The Commissioner and the advisory council had headquarters in Tripoli. On the Commissioner's Advisory Council were representatives from Tripolitania, Cyrenaica, Kazan, France, Italy, the United Kingdom, Egypt, Pakistan, the United States, and one minority group delegate. But they did not remain long within the four walls of their headquarters. They traveled throughout Libya. to thousands of people trying to absorb the problems, gauge reactions, judge what type of government the people needed and wanted. Cyrenaicans, Tripolitanians, the Fezzanese, the council saw them all and sensed the very traditions which would have to be protected in the formation of a new state. Despite the diversity of areas, there was a strong spirit of Libyan nationalism. This too, the United Nations Council sensed and noted. By train, plane, auto, and on foot, the United Nations survey covered thousands of miles. The United Nations Commissioner and the Advisory Council were warmly received throughout the territory. High point of the trip was a visit to Benghazi, where the delegates paid a call on the Emir of Cyrenaica. The visitors were received in front of the Emir's palace. were welcomed into the palace, and later on the balcony, they conferred with the Emir, the sage Muslim leader who personifies the Libyan spirit. The Emir stated his full support for the United Nations resolution providing for the independence of Libya. Soon afterwards, the United Nations group returned to its headquarters. Um, I should tell you that the account of what happened in the General Assembly is complete anti-communist rubbish, uh, as, uh, as in that YouTube, I'm not sure what it came from, Pathy News or, or something, the story is much more complicated and uh, um, nobody's motives are beyond question. The US and the UK were indeed in favor of trusteeship until they discovered that they wouldn't then be able to keep their military bases, which was their major interest in the uh, future arrangements for, uh, for, for Libya. Um, but uh, I won't uh, offer you too much history now. The, the, the reason I wanted to, sh to show that is because uh, um, Libya is uh, a country that is extraordinarily welcoming to the United Nations uh, at the moment. 
Um, that is in part because of the view of the majority of Libyans of the role of the United Nations in 2011 and their uh, positive appreciation of uh, Security Council resolutions 1970 and 1973. But it is also because of, uh, of this history, um, which is frequently referred to, was referred to by uh, the Libyan uh, Deputy Perm Representative in the, in the Security Council uh, yesterday. Um, and I believe uh, that uh, to that positive history, uh, we can now add the role that the United Nations has played in the first elections in Libya uh, for nearly half a century. Um, I'm sure you all read the New York Times. Uh, if so, the article you would have read on the eve of the elections uh, began the first election in more than four decades was supposed to forge a new Libya, but threatens instead to tear it apart. Um, uh, and you could have read much more of the, the same uh, in the international media. Um, but in fact, the elections have turned out, I think, to be um, an extraordinary achievement. Um, it's always very dangerous, of course, to be positive in the, too positive in the immediate aftermath of, of an election before all the subsequent uh, difficulties uh, manifest themselves again. Um, but nonetheless, the fact that Libya was able to hold this election and hold it so well uh, in such a short time after the end of the conflict is something that I think nobody watching Libya from here in the middle of last year would have dared to, uh, to, to predict. Uh, and indeed, um, as I've indicated, was not the prediction of, of many people right up to the eve of the uh, election. Uh, the High National Election Commission, the, the independent Libyan body which organized the election, did a quite extraordinary job, starting from nothing. Uh, it was appointed uh, in late January. Um, it, the members didn't know each other. Um, it had uh, no premises, uh, no staff, uh, no internal procedures or regulations. Um, and it set about working to establish that uh, with the, the support of the uh, the UN um, electoral team. Uh, and if you read now, not only the media accounts of the election, but the reports of the different observer groups, uh, principally the uh, African Union, League of Arab States, European Union, Carter Center, uh, that observed the elections, you will find them uh, extremely positive in the manner in which the elections were, were, were carried out. Um, uh, they were carried out in a manner that, that uh, were as inclusive, I think, as an election commission could manage in the circumstances with concern for the opportunity of uh, various groups of internally displaced people, some displaced at the end of the conflict, others displaced by recent local conflicts um, uh, were, uh, were enabled to, um, to, to vote. Um, and uh, the briefing I had given to the council the last time I was here two months ago uh, was reporting on a number of uh, uh, serious local conflicts, um, one of which continued, another of which erupted uh, in the period uh, very close to the election. Um, and yet those areas were sufficiently stabilized for the election to, to take place and the election commission went on negotiating to enable the, the, the Tubu minority in the south or to persuade them to participate in the, in the election. Um, the uh, big question on the eve of the election was the extent to which uh, it would be disrupted by those in the east of Libya who had first boycotted the electoral process and then called not only for a boycott, but, but had, had, had threatened and began to carry out violence to prevent it going forward. Um, these are generally referred to as the, the Federalists, um, although 
Uh, one can make a more complicated analysis of the uh, of the forces that were perhaps involved in in wanting to to spoil the election. Um, but the principal group, having begun with a demand for uh, a, a federal constitution, um, uh, then uh, was uh, highly critical of the allocation of seats to the uh, the, the regions of Libya, which again takes us back to 1950-51, when, as you as you saw in the uh, the, the first. Uh, uh, map, uh, Libya emerged from three provinces of the former Ottoman Empire, uh, Cyrenaica, Tripolitania, and, uh, and Fezzan. And right from the very beginning of independent Libya, a key issue was the balance between those regions, uh, the uh, extent to which representation was to be on the basis of population, uh, where the majority, two-thirds majority, is in the West, uh, or on the basis of equal representation of those regions. Um, and in fact, the first constitution that Adrian Pelton co-negotiated in 1950-51 was a federalist constitution, uh, which uh, Libya uh, abandoned in 1963 when managing the oil wealth almost forced the uh, uh, the, the, the full unification. So there's nothing surprising in the fact that uh, um, there should be voices for federalism again, uh, and the feelings of eastern Libya are added to by um, uh, its marginalization by Gaddafi. Uh, he never liked it. It never liked him. Chairman Jalil said to me the other day, there was not a village in eastern Libya that supported Gaddafi. Um, uh, uh, and certainly, despite the fact that uh, uh, the majority of the oil wealth originates in the in the east, a uh, few of the resources of the centralized state were invested there. So there's a very strong feeling of uh, of marginalization, uh, and that did indeed translate into a strong feeling that an allocation of seats, um, which was a compromise between population and, and geography, but gave the East 60 seats compared to 100 for the, for the West, was uh, uh, in, in Eastern perceptions uh, uh, unfair to the, to the East. Um, so those who maintain that, 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 um, that view is broadly shared, but only a minority were prepared on that basis to try to prevent the elections going ahead. Um, uh, and again, that posed the election commission with some extraordinary challenges in, in carrying out the election. Um, the ballot papers for over 40 polling centers were destroyed in a fire at 3 a.m. on the morning of the Thursday before Saturday's poll. Uh, they were reprinted in Dubai uh, under the UN contract and which had originally been printed the same day and flown in in the early hours of uh, election day, um, distributed despite uh, roadblocks so that all those polling centers in fact operated. Uh, and in Benghazi itself, where uh, there were attacks on, on polling centers, they were seen off mainly by the evident determination of the majority to cast their votes and um, unarmed voters linking arms to protect polling stations even in the, uh, the, face of, uh, the face of violence and then centers that could only open late, staying, staying open in the evening to allow people to, uh, to cast their, their votes. Um, so the security challenges to the elections remarkably um, were uh, successfully resisted. Um, the participation rate o overall was about 62%, uh, lower for women than for men, as uh, uh, in the case of voter registration. Uh, but despite that, there was uh, uh, extremely enthusiastic participation by uh, many women voters, um, and indeed uh, uh, a large number of women candidates, mostly on the party lists rather than standing as, as individuals. Uh, only one woman uh, has been elected from the, um, the individual, the majoritarian seats, 
uh, but from the party lists, 33, uh, 32 women uh, have been elected, so there will be 33 women in the 200-member National Congress, uh, which is a significant start for um, a country that remains extremely socially uh, conservative. Um, and there, there is significant representation of, uh, uh, of Libya's minorities, the, the Amazir or, or Berber minority, Tuareg and Tabu representatives have all been elected to the National Congress. Um, the United Nations, of course, is not interested in the outcome of elections, uh, only uh, in the uh, fact that the uh, will of the people shall prevail in the choice of their representatives. Um, uh, but to some extent, the outcome is causing some people to rewrite the narrative of the Arab, uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, the overwhelming victor in the party race uh, was a coalition called the Coalition of National Forces assembled by Dr. Mahmoud Jibril, who uh, you will have heard of uh, uh, as properly termed the chairman of the executive committee of the National Transitional Council during last year, but commonly referred to as the, the then prime minister of, uh, uh, of Libya. Um, uh, that coalition uh, got some 49% of the uh, of the of the vote. Um, um, uh, the second place uh, in the party list was the Justice and Construction Party, which was established uh, with others by the by the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, but what is not clear at this point are the allegiances of the uh, 120 uh, members as against the 80 from the party lists who were elected uh, in local constituencies, um, many of whom are independents, but some uh, either are members of, of the emerging parties um, or may now identify themselves with those parties. So already there has begun a, a period of, uh, uh, of negotiation and dialogue amongst the, uh, the different political groups as to how a new government will be, will be formed. Um, uh, a prime minister is to be chosen within a month of the first meeting of the newly elected National Congress. Um, the other big task that flows from this election is the task of constitution making. Um, and that has been left in, in a, a state of some uncertainty. Um, the original assumption was that the National Congress would establish a constitution drafting body, uh, but as an initial concession to the demand of the East that I've referred to for equal representation, uh, the NTC agreed that the constitution should be drafted by a separate constitutional commission equally composed 2020-20 uh, from the three regions as the 1950 National Assembly uh, had been. Um, uh, the assumption was that that itself would be chosen by, or not, not they would not be members of the National Congress, but members of the National Congress would appoint that, that body. But on the eve of the election, or a couple of days before the election, in order to further try to take the steam out of the, uh, the threats to disrupt the election, the NTC uh, voted uh, that the, um, uh, the Constitutional Commission should be directly elected on a regional basis. Um, now, members, some members of the National Congress have already openly questioned uh, whether that should be followed, um, and there is general agreement that the National Congress is now a sovereign body. It's as a first elected body. It's not necessarily bound by decisions of the uh, uh, of the National Transitional Council. Um, but there's an important period ahead of, of dialogue and negotiation, I think, between the newly elected uh, political leaders and, and representatives um, and those uh, forces in the East that are um, determined to have a, a strong share in the drafting of the, of the future constitution. Um, 
so far as the United Nations is, is concerned, um, I've already uh, referred to the, the, the role that we played in support of this electoral process um, and the next logical stage in the implementation of ANSMIL's mandate to support the democratic transition in Libya uh, is to provide support to the National Congress and to the constitution-making process. Um, and that we're certainly willing to do, and we again means UNSMIL and, uh, and UNDP. Um, but as has been our, our stance in all matters, we await the, the wishes and requests of the Libyans to, to see what kind of engagement they want in terms of, uh, uh, of international expertise in their constitution drafting process. Um, when I briefed the council yesterday, uh, the larger part of my briefing, uh, the, uh, uh, beyond that of uh, describing the, uh, the election process, uh, was to focus on the key challenges that, that, that we believe face the new government. Um, and those are obviously very great indeed. Um, Everybody agrees, I think, that the issue uppermost in the minds of voters is that of security. Um, and that has a number of, uh, of dimensions. Um, one dimension is the, the, the transition from the revolutionary brigades, often referred to as militia in, uh, in, in, in media reporting, uh, and the, uh, the former revolutionary fighters, um, the, the transition to uh, a monopoly of, uh, of force on the part of the state, uh, state security forces, uh, and providing futures for the former revolutionary fighters, either in state security forces, as a minority of them uh, appear to wish, uh, or in civilian uh, uh, occupations and, and futures. Um, that's not an issue which the uh, outgoing interim government has really been able to grasp very uh, effectively. Um, uh, and it certainly needs uh, a stronger government resting on the, the legitimacy of this election. Um, however, um, again, I would uh, somewhat modify the, the impression of media reporting that, that Libya is in the hands of, uh, of warring militia that wish to uh, remain in separate existence and uh, continue challenging state authority. The, the great majority of the uh, revolutionary brigades do indeed want to transition to state authority and some of their individuals, but not all, want a place within that. Um, but we have had a period in which there's been a sort of strange halfway house in which the Brigades have been supplementing the role of the police in public security in the uh, uh, towns and cities, including during the election, and others of the brigades have been um, called in the aid of the um, very limited national army uh, in response to uh, some of the local conflicts that have uh, erupted. But the major challenge now in, in which uh, UNSMIL is already quite deeply involved with both the, uh, the, the defense forces and the police um, is to develop uh, proper state security forces under uh, the democratic uh, control of now this national congress and, and elected government uh, and provide futures for um, those who have made up the, uh, the revolutionary brigades. Um, the needs of security are particularly acute in relation to the management of Libya's borders, and that's a major regional uh, as well as national concern uh, on which, again, there's been little progress and much confusion to date, um, and particularly Libya's southern border uh, with the uh, state of things in the Sahel to the, to the south uh, and growing trafficking of persons, drugs, weapons um, um, across that border um, is a major challenge for, for, for Libya uh, in which it will need international assistance. The other big area of, of, of challenge uh, to draw attention to uh, is that of 
justice, human rights, transitional justice, rule of law. Um, the Libya obviously faces a, a, a terrible legacy from the human rights violations of the Gaddafi period with thousands of people uh, still, still missing and efforts to discover the fate of those who disappeared either in Gaddafi's prisons or during the conflict uh, last year. Um, uh, then at the end of the conflict, uh, the, the prisons having been emptied, um, uh, whether of political prisoners or criminals, um, uh, by the by, the end of the conflict, um, um, with some of the remaining political prisoners being massacred at the end of the conflict by by the Gaddafi regime forces, um, the uh, the revolutionary brigades took into custody uh, some seven, eight, nine thousand people, um, remnants of Gaddafi's forces, but also people accused, a, a significant proportion of sub-Saharan Africans accused, probably in most cases wrongly, um, of uh, uh, having uh, uh, been mercenaries or in some way supporting the, the regime. Um, uh, most of those people still remain in custody. Uh, less than half of them by now have been transferred to proper full custody of the, of the state. Um, uh, while the state still lacks capacity in, in, in its uh, prison officials, uh, there's been serious uh, mistreatment, torture, deaths in custody in, in some of those places of detention, although um, uh, in some cases the, the brigades have run detention centers more, more, more reasonably. Um, but there is an urgent need to get the proper justice system up and running, and, and certainly the UN has been working with the training of, uh, of prosecutors so that uh, those cases can be screened, so that those who Libya is determined to bring to justice, uh, both the high profile detainees uh, and the uh, uh, more ordinary detainees uh, uh, who do have evidence against them of grave human rights violations uh, can be properly put on trial. And that's, that's essential in order to discourage um, people taking the law into their own hands in order to prevent continuing uh, attempts to, to arrest people uh, outside the, the processes of law. And it's essential too in settling a number of the local conflicts where the need for uh, a proper justice system to, um, uh, to, to, to take on the cases of, of those who are accused by one community or another of, of major past crimes is, um, is significant. Libya has many other challenges beyond these which I talk about because they're the ones that, that uh, the United Nations mission is most in, engaged with. Um, Gaddafi left it with virtually none of the institutions of a modern state uh, and so the capacity development task uh, uh, is immense. Uh, the challenge of public financial management, of managing its oil wealth without uh, a return to corruption uh, uh, and, and patronage is a huge one. And how to diversify the economy so that um, it doesn't consist simply of handouts from the oil money, uh, but real employment for uh, especially the, the growing number of young Libyans. Uh, these are colossal challenges, so nobody should uh, think that uh, one successful election, as we've learned very well elsewhere, um, uh, solves the, the problems of a, of, of a nation that is starting um, uh, at a very early stage of, of both nation building and state building. But nonetheless, this election is a very significant and, and necessary step in uh, in in that uh, direction um, and uh, uh, one that Libyans at the moment are are taking great pride in and are entitled to take great pride in and it's been a privilege for for me and my colleagues to uh, be assisting them through that period thank you Thank you very much, Ian. The, 
uh, I'm going to open the floor for um, the, to questions with with our participants. I would like to start perhaps with two two things which uh, came to my mind as I was listening to to you. The first is. I've been reading media reports and or uh, comments from uh, research institutes, the, which gave the impression that there is a kind of a very determined calendar of the steps ahead. With I think I read somewhere that the constitution is going to be drafted in 120 days. Uh, there'll be a prime minister, government. The, uh, and then I, I, I listened to you and I, I, I understood that, in fact, the uh, even the, 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 the composition of the uh, uh, Constitutional Commission is not that really, they, they, is not that obvious. There may be a little bit of bargaining between the uh, uh, various actors to know how its members are going to be designated. The, so uh, this is the first question. How, where do these information of these calendars, where, where, where does it come from? Is it realistic? Can we anticipate that there is now the process is on track and, 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 and uh, uh, with uh, some sense of uh, urgency in, in, in making progress? The, the other question I had was about uh, state institutions and, and, and their weaknesses. Do, do we have currently a bureaucracy which uh, perceive income uh, is equipped to allocate the resource. Uh, how does it work do you, do you, in, your, in your contact? Do you, do, you, do you think that this is something where progress can be expected, or is it going to be a main uh, problem? When we discuss the, uh, the, all the issue of how to reintegrate members of the Revolutionary Brigade, this a considerable amount of resource is going to be needed to uh, to to move this process forward. Do do the Libyans have the bureaucracy to to support this uh, this process? How does the uh, uh, the management of the uh, the fiscal resource uh, uh, is it promising? Is it very weak? What is your point of view? The timetable was set out by the National Transitional Council in their their uh, uh, constitutional declaration, uh, uh, Article 30, and they've amended it a couple of times. Um, uh, I mean, the first thing to say, it's remarkable how close they've come to respecting that timetable in the holding of the elections, because the, uh, the first elements of the timetable was that an electoral law was to be drafted within 90 days of the Declaration of Liberation, elections held within 240 days of the Declaration of, of Liberation. Um, that would have been June the 19th. Um, uh, again, if I can get in one more dig at some of the media reporting, you will have read that it was a terrible failure that they had to postpone the elections um, uh, and that they didn't take place on the 19th of June. It was actually a perfectly necessary and sensible decision to take the two and a half weeks more that was necessary for uh, both the technical preparations to be complete and indeed for political parties to have an opportunity to and candidates to, uh, to, to to campaign. But there was a moment when the projection of that looked at this was uh, um, that, that this was a failure, whereas the remarkable thing is is the extent to which the timetable was kept to. You can make the opposite criticism. Some people would argue that elections were held too soon, although, again, as I think I've already implied, I would make the contrary argument that, that the, the need for a fully legitimate government was, uh, was, was urgent to tackle Libya's challenges. Now, the way the timetable and the Constitutional Declaration plays out now is um, uh, 30 days to appoint a prime minister from the uh, uh, from the first meeting of the National Congress. 30 days originally to appoint a constitutional commission, but that's the uh, the aspect that I've indicated was called into question by the last minute decision of the NTC that it should be directly elected. Um, but then how that then played out was to be four months for constitution drafting. Uh, put to a referendum, um, 30 days once approved by a referendum to draft an electoral law, uh, 180 days, I think, to the first elections under the... Now, I mean, that's, that's all there. Uh, it is called into question now by the argument around the Constitutional Commission, but as I've also said, 
I think the National Congress is entitled to to review aspects of the of the timetable, um, and there may be some ways in which they're 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 well advised to. Um, so uh, so now everything really depends upon the, um, the the decisions that the newly newly emerged political forces. Uh, 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 discuss and agree with each other. The the NTC now dissolves the the moment uh, the first meeting of the National Congress uh, takes place. Um, in terms of the capacity of state institutions, uh, the capacity is extremely weak, um, but the numbers are extremely large. Um, Libya has a hugely bloated bureaucracy. Um, uh, 1.3 million people on the state payroll, I think. Um, uh, and indeed, there's a temptation to add to that now in terms of sort of a common, you know, uh, uh, finding uh, roles for, for revolutionaries and, and so on. Um, there was a very conscious decision not to engage in a sort of debathification process, so only some of the very evident uh, uh, Gaddafi regime loyalists who self-identified by fleeing or, or in a really rather few cases were were suspended by the uh, the new authorities the the the, the bulk of that uh, bureaucracy remains in in place um uh, but the problem is there's been a sort of huge gap between that and and new ministers who who've come in uh, because there's not much in the way of levers between the uh, uh, between between ministers and and people in that bureaucracy who can actually make things things happen and and deliver. So there's a huge need for sort of what we would call civil service reform. Um, obviously, already the process of identifying from within that bureaucracy those people who do have the commitment, competence uh, uh, to to be valuable public servants is sort of beginning to to happen. Um, but except for the National Oil Corporation, which for obvious reasons was protected as an area of real professionalism um, and, and perhaps the central bank, um, institutional capacity in other areas is very weak and uh, the government has found that in terms of uh, um, you know, spending the budget that it allocated to to itself for the current uh, the current period. Um, there's no doubt that Libya is has been hugely over centralised, um, uh, and and therefore, uh, you know, anywhere you go in the country, the local council will complain about the sort of the, the lack of uh, uh, of central funding flowing through uh, to the to, to localities. Um, um, a lot of them think it's discrimination against them, whether it's because they're in the east or because they're in the Nafusa Mountains or because they were thought to be pro-Gaddafi or for any other reasons, but it actually it's, fairly, it's a fairly general lack of capacity to be able to, to deliver resources at a local level. Um, and whatever constitutional decisions are taken around um, uh, you know, the, the, the future state, the, the most extreme form being federalism, Clearly, major decentralization of, of, of government is, is going to be necessary, and that is quite widely, quite widely recognized, um, uh, including with the drafting of a local government law uh, by the local government minister in the NTC, but, but no decisions yet being, being taken. Um, so, no, there's a, there's a, the, the, the new government will still be um, uh, very much constrained by the machinery of government that it inherits uh, to 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 deliver services of any kind. Thank you so much. May, may I invite questions, the, uh, sir? We can take the two questions together. Uh, thank you. I'm Hugh Roberts, the Guardian, and formerly uh, the UN. Um, I, I'm wondering if, in the the kind of vast myriad activities um, we do in the UN, if this isn't actually the best thing which is happening right now. And if that is the case, um, it obviously puts quite a burden on, 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 on the team in Libya, but it also means that the UN should be doing everything it can to make sure it is a success, or you can claim in a year or two it is a kind of credible success. 
So with that in mind, what is the kind of greatest internal problem that you have faced in implementing the mandate? Is it, is it recruitment? Is it support from headquarters? Can you just speak about some of the things which maybe are holding you back, um, not in the Libyan context, but in the UN context? Uh, Jeff Laurenti with the Century Foundation. Ian, a great report, as your report yesterday to the Security Council was. I have a question actually regarding some external actors. A number of major European countries, uh, drawn like flies to honey by Libya's oil resources, had variously in recent years embraced and then last year repudiated the Gaddafi regime. Uh, to what extent have they been able to forge new ties and how hard have they been working at forging such ties with influential actors or potentially influential actors in Libya? Were they, did they have horses they were betting on in the elections perhaps? Uh, to what extent uh, have they been interested in and in supportive of your own mission's work? Um, I think I'd like to answer the first question initially by saying how I think in the planning and development of, of, of Unsmill we overcame what uh, uh, can be problems uh, in, the, in, in the UN system because, uh, uh, I mean, one of my personal obsessions is, is the view that, um, you know, we should never plan from templates and that uh, every context should be looked at in its own terms. And uh, um, I, I'm fond of quoting the person who once said to me, we don't want designer missions, we do template missions, to which my answer is we should always do designer missions. Uh, um, uh, even boutique missions were referred to. Um, uh, um, so, so I mean, the last thing I'm saying is that is that Libya is now a template that that you know is appropriate to somewhere else. The the, the fundamental point is that we uh, uh, we started trying to understand what the particularities of Libya would be, and therefore what would be needed and appropriate in the in the Libyan context. Um, uh, now, you know, I'd like to pay tribute to Lynn Pasco, who is the person who decided that even as the mediation track began, so too should begin the the planning for the future post-contract conflict role of the of, of the UN, um, because that doesn't always happen. Of course, it can't always happen because sometimes the UN is pitchforked into into situations, um, and even in this case, we didn't know how long we would have the uh, the, the period we had turned out to be long enough to, uh, uh, to, to accomplish a great deal in our uh, initial assessment without being so long that we all got bored and went off to do other things. <laughs> so, so, uh, um, so that kind of period between uh, April and August last year in which um, um, those in, in the system sort of worked together to, to, to think um, uh, how we would, would respond when the conflict came to an end, I think, was uh, uh, the right sort of period of time. Um, and it really did, I believe, help to overcome, um, you know, some of the potential, um, you know, turf battles, uh, institutional sort of rivalries of bits of the system. We, we managed to have a process in which by focusing initially not on, you know, I want to do this because this is what I do, and uh, uh, but which focused on this is Libya and this is uh, what Libya is likely to need. And before we get to the question of who can, you know, who can provide that, let's try to analyze what the uh, what the what the needs are. Um, so there was a very strong commitment to integration in that in that planning process that has carried forward into the into the mission. Um, aided in a way by the fact that um, you know one of one of the problems the UN has is when a, when a, a large mission lands on an existing country team who, who suddenly finds this elephant in their room um, uh, well you know the country team in Libya had always been very small had been uh, evacuated so in fact, we all planned together and went back in together um, and and that I think 
makes it easier than some, some other contexts. Um, you mentioned recruitment, and, and uh, you know we, we all know recruitment is a, a, a huge problem. And in you know, in my view, nothing is more critical to the quality of a mission, obviously, than the quality of the personnel. Um, the system has a problem now uh, with the availability of Arabic-speaking um, personnel. Um, uh, and needs to be thinking about that because we can assume that the needs, the demands for Arabic-speaking personnel are going to going to grow um, uh, and can't be met simply by you know robbing each other of uh, uh, of, uh, of the limited number of, of, of personnel uh, uh, available. Um, um, so that was a constraint, and and of course the extent to which recruitment procedures make it difficult to recruit people from outside the system um, then becomes a, a constraint uh, in a context like that where, where um, you know, to find Arabic-speaking personnel you may need to look outside the system. Uh, but also, if I can push another view of my own a little further, because in my experience um, in I mentioned East Timor and Nepal particularly, nothing is more crucial to the quality of the mission than having some people who are genuine specialists in the country or region that you're, that you're working in. Um, uh, yes, it's important for people, some people to bring UN experience, but it's also important to have at least a, a core of, of real uh, uh, expertise uh, on the, the country you're working on. Um, so, uh, frankly, we haven't had major problems. Um, the concept of the mission on, on which I'd sort of refer you to the one written Secretary General's report that we've uh, produced so far last, uh, last March is one that could have caused us um, problems because our concept has been to try to keep the the core staff of the mission relatively small, as, as small as, as possible. Um, I was convinced in the beginning that, that we wanted what Mr. Brahimi would have called a light footprint uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Libya. Um, Libya would not take kindly after years of isolation and a good deal of xenophobia to being overrun with white UN vehicles and internationals of different uh, different kinds, quite apart from the security situation. So, so a premium on trying to, to keep the core presence small, but then to be able to respond quickly and flexibly to identified needs. Um, um, uh, that implies having uh, a rather large proportion of senior people to be able to bring in and deploy others rather than the kind of classic pyramid uh, uh, structure, um, which isn't immediately attractive to ACABQ. Um, uh, and it also requires uh, a significant sort of consultancy budget rather than a um, you know, rather than funds for, for, for posts. Now, now, so far, we've been able to uh, persuade people, including the budgetary authorities, to mainly go along with our proposals in 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 this respect. Uh, but these are things that can be uh, can be problems. Um, Jeff's question uh, um, about the, uh, the 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 past uh, records of different countries and their current interests. Um, I, I think the starting point I would like to make there is that is that. Libya is is you know grateful to its friends, but it is not interested in being in anybody's particular sphere of of influence, um, uh, and that applies to you know the the countries that it sees as having been most supportive uh, during uh, twenty eleven, uh, to to historical ties to regional actors and and so on. Um, I think uh, Libya is 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 going to continue to have a very strong sense of its own national ownership and and, and independence and um, um, and and yes and and of course you know uh, any oil rich country is wise to be suspicious of uh, of bilateral agendas and they are uh, <laughs> um, uh, and, and this of course is another reason I mean perhaps a more negative one why 
there's quite a strong desire in having assistance coordinated within a UN framework and, and um, you know, uh, the, the perceiving the UN as, as not uh, representing or, or favouring any of those bilateral interests is, uh, uh, is another reason why we're able to be, uh, uh, able to be effective, I think. Um, I don't think, I didn't see any particular evidence that um, uh, international actors were backing particular horses in the, in the elections. Um, um, you know, what suspicions were voiced in that direction were, were regional rather than, uh, rather than uh, uh, towards sort of Europe or the, or the West. Um, and, and frankly, I don't think anybody knew well enough what the emerging political forces were represented, would represent in, in future. Um, uh, so um, uh, so I, 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 again, I, th I think the the nature of engagement with the election has uh, has also sustained the the independence of the Libyan political forces in general. Thank you. I see uh, two questions: one on the right and another one over there. Uh, can you tell me what the ICC question was about? Um, Bill Pace with WFM. Uh, I'm wondering, in the Gaddafi government was a main funder of the African Union, or at least that's what we were told. And I'm wondering if anything in the last uh, 15 months is less is lessons learned. Uh, will, do you expect that Libya will go back and be a strong funder of the African Union, or will experience impact of that? Uh, a kind of corollary question is, is was there some um, uh, ongoing relationships between Libya and the AU in this uh, process uh, in the last uh, eight or nine months? And was there any cross-fertilization between what was going on in Tunisia, in Libya, and Egypt? Thank you. Okay, that's a lot of questions wrapped together, Bill. Um, uh, I'll come back to the ICC. Let me try, try that first. Um, um, the AU relate. I mean, I don't know the. I, I mean, it is known that Libya is one of the five core funders of the was one of the five core funders of the African Union. What is less clear is what other financial ties the the, the were were more murky in in nature uh, with, um, uh, with 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 African uh, African leaders. Um, uh, and there's no doubt that uh, that that has left um, uh, you know left 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 scars in Libya itself. Um, Gaddafi's attempt to, um, you know, to impose an African identity um, uh, has been, in a way, counterproductive in terms of, of the, the perceptions of, of ordinary Libyans. The new authorities have, I think, been been very constructive in their desire to um, establish good relations with the African Union. Um, collectively, as well as with individual uh, neighbouring and other African countries, uh, individually, despite the the coolness uh, from the period of the of the conflict, and um, uh, I haven't been at the AU summit that's just happened, but I was at the one at the end of uh, uh, the end of January where. Libya was strongly represented and, and, and in general very well received in, in fact um, uh, um, as, um, as one African foreign minister said to me it's a relief to be dealing with sane people but, um, uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, so uh, uh, you know so, so there is um, and the, the, the AU has only fairly recently although they announced um, and uh, Chairman Ping came to Tripoli announced that they would open an African Union office it's only fairly recently that the uh, representative has arrived the first uh, real activity they've undertaken was their observation team uh, during these uh, these elections League of Arab States similarly is now now represented on the on, on the ground. Um, 
So, um, uh, so in terms of the, the AU, there's a, there's a sort of rebuilding of a new relationship. What that means financially for the African Union, um, uh, I uh, happily am not required to, to know. Um, uh, the regional effect I don't think has been very great, in fact. Um, you know, Libya has largely seen itself and its, uh, certainly its election in its own terms. Um, uh, you know, there's uh, a great deal of gratitude, particularly towards Tunisia, for the Tunisian role in receiving uh, Libyan, uh, Libyan refugees. Um, there are, of course, uh, there are um, you know tensions over the management of the border, um, which is uh, uh, where I mean, really, I think it's it's Libya's difficulty in managing its own border that is a problem for its uh, for its neighbours, uh, and of course, there are huge questions as to the terms on which migrant labour in general, but including from, from Egypt and Tunisia, is going to be received in, in Libya in, in future. Um, but um, uh, there's a big potential, particularly for, um, you know, for strengthening relations between Libya and Tunisia and in a larger Maghreb uh, context as, as well, which I think all the Maghreb countries are very interested in. And, uh, President Marzouki of Tunisia has been particularly eloquent in um, um, in, in proclaiming. Um, as far as the ICC is concerned, I mean, you know, in truth, I don't know much that isn't in the public domain because um, uh, um, uh, because the UN role was to sort of provide security and logistical support to the ICC team that was. Uh, uh, negotiating the release of those who were who were detained, and, and of course uh, my own good offices in urging that that should happen as as quickly as possible. Um, you know, so really, I I'm in no position to pronounce. I mean, I can tell you that uh, senior Libyan figures, and and not just people on the ground in Zintan, which were sometimes implied, but to the level of the prime minister and the chairman of the NTC. Uh, felt genuinely aggrieved at what they believed or what had been reported to them uh, as to the alleged abuse of uh, uh, the uh, the access to, to Saif al Islam uh, Gaddafi, um, but I'm you know but I'm in no position to, uh, to to form any judgment on that myself, and it's subject now to an investigation by the ICC itself. So I think we all have to see what is said there. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. I think we are approaching the end of the meeting, so I'd like to invite just a couple of last questions on, on the right and uh, closer on this on, to the left, please. Hello. Uh, is it working? Hey, uh, Elodie Convern from the UN Department of Field Support. I was wondering, um, as a senior field leader, what particular challenges do you meet in the context of Libya as compared to the other positions you held before? And since you announced you'll be leaving soon, what do you think are the skills required for your successor in the, in the context of Libya? Uh, Sean Kane, uh, formerly the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue representative in Benghazi. Ian, I was wondering if I could ask you to look forward in how the elections may change dynamics at the local level. We've seen, for example, some of the more militant Federalists be chastened by the reaction of the, the public dem demonstration of will to vote during the elections. In some of the other local conflicts, the last government, as you know, didn't really see its role to get involved in those that wanted to del deliver elections. It didn't really want to do conflict prevention, conflict resolution, take on the local powers that be. Will this government be confident enough to do that? Will it see that as its mandate or because it it's elected, but it's still a temporary government. Will it also want to not really wade in to that extent? I'll, I'll take the second question first. And I, I think it's very hard to know. I mean, uh, certainly in terms of the new government. Um, but where I would be a bit hopeful is in terms of the potential role of the you know locally elected representatives. Um, because as you know, Sean, I mean, NTC members have tried to play some role in the mediation of local conflicts from their areas, 
but they've rarely been the right people to, you know, to actually do that. And partly they haven't been the right people because their own local legitimacy has been open to question because they, you know, emerge in whatever way they emerge during the formation of the NTC. So the fact that there are now legitimate people elected um, uh, in terms of national congress members and increasingly local councils, because again, you know, we now have in Benghazi uh, 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 a local council that, that as in Misrata, the, of legitimacy, and the more that happens elsewhere, then the more I think you begin to have a local leadership that. Um, uh, you know, that hopefully will be capable of, of playing a, a, a constructive and representative role in the, the mediation of those conflicts. So I think in that sense, the election is a step forward. Um, uh, how far a new government um, organizes itself better to take on that, that responsibility, uh, we have to see, but it's certainly something that, uh, um, you know, that we should all be sort of urging, uh, urging upon them. Um, the other question, of course, is the extent to which the, the security forces develop in a way that means that there really are um, neutral actors able to uh, deploy rapidly where there's a need for kind of local, local peacekeeping. Um, uh, and we're seeing a bit of a development of thinking and capacity in that, in that respect. So as with everything, it won't, it won't happen overnight, but I, I'd, I'd be a little optimistic that there are some, some, some positive elements to, uh, increasingly positive elements to work with. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not going to rise to the, uh, <laughs> the request to uh, uh, define the, uh, uh, the skill set for uh, uh, an SRSG in, uh, in, in Libya. Um, uh, no, I'm really not. No, I'm really not. <laughs> certainly, certainly not publicly. Um, uh, and in terms of the first part of the question, sort of, you know, comparing challenges, um, I mean, I really go back to, you know, people often ask you sort of how you carry your experience from one place to, to another. Um, the, I, I've been in a number of different places, but the three places where I've um, uh, played the most central role have been, have been East Timor, Nepal, and Libya, and frankly, I can find nothing in common between them. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'd like to believe that, that, you know, I may have developed some, uh, some, some skills that then turned out to be relevant somewhere else, but, uh, uh, but I do firmly believe what I said earlier on, that, that, that the most important thing in every context is to, uh, Try to understand it in its own own terms and and relate to it and uh, begin with the history. So. Well, th thank you so much, Ian, and um, I think I speak in the name of uh, all of us here to uh, uh, congratulate you for your achievements in Libya and and the achievements of your your staff and of other uh, United Nations personnel there in you know cooperating with the. Libyan authorities and the uh, and, and civil society actors over there. It's been extremely encouraging to uh, listen to what you had to say on this uh, uh, on latest developments, and we wish you the best for the for the future. Thank you. <laughs>